When we originally talked about Oprah Winfrey on this show, on the radio show, about, I think, last week, I got this call on the radio. Listen. Let's go to Anita. Hello, Anita. You're on the Glenn Beck program. Hi, Glenn. Um, I guess what really has just upset me, this whole thing with Emmett Till, never since the history of our great nation has there ever been a couple brutally, brutally tortured like Shannon Christian and Kristen Newsom in Knoxville, Tennessee. And I'm just wondering when, and I pray that it's you, is somebody going to share their horror? Because nobody... Again, since the history of this great nation has ever been brutally tortured like that young couple. Okay. Never. All right, well, let me look into it. All right, it. so we, we said we would look into it. She asked, when would somebody do something about it? And the answer is, tonight, we did look into it. And I led with Oprah Winfrey and her non-apology apology because it was Emmett Till that she said, oh, you know, it's just the same thing. Trayvon Martin and Emmett Till, they're not. Emmett Till is not the same story as Trayvon. And I did the monologue last week and said, would you tell me which one do you think? Does it sound the same? You tell me if there's any similar similarities here. The names the woman gave me were Christopher Newsom and Shannon um, Christian. Likely they mean as much to you as they did to me, but you'll never forget them after the next few minutes. Probably the first time you heard about them tonight. But the incident happened in 2007. Newsom, 23-year-old. He was a former standout baseball player. He was working as a carpenter. Christian, 21, was a student at the University of Tennessee. They had been dating for about two months. On the night of January 6th, they planned to watch a movie at a friend's apartment. When Shannon um, didn't show up, she didn't show up to work the next day, the family became concerned and they reported them both missing. Well, it turns out that the couple had made it to dinner, but when they arrived at the apartment complex where Christian's best friends lived, they were carjacked by multiple assailants. What followed was one of the most heinous, gruesome, senseless hate crimes ever. If you have kids, I suggest that you fast forward through this part of the program or put it on pause and watch it later. The evening started with a wonderful day boyfriend and girlfriend. Now, here he was, gagged with a sock in his mouth. His ankles were bound with his own belt. His hands were tied behind his back, and his face was wrapped with a bandana. His head was covered with a sweatshirt that was tied around his neck. He was then violently raped with an object and beaten. One can only imagine the horror Christopher experienced as he was then forced to walk barefoot to the nearby railroad tracks where he was shot in the neck and the back. But the shots didn't kill him. He fell to the ground and he was paralyzed. That's when the assailants stood over him, placed the gun against his covered head and fired. They killed him execution style, but that's still not good enough. They then poured gasoline all over his body and set him ablaze. Now, let me ask Miss Oprah Winfrey, what does that story sound like, Oprah? Gee, it sounds almost like Emmett Till, doesn't it? This is your Emmett Till story. It's not your sad hoodie story or your really tragically sad purse story. This is Emmett Till. And you really can't think of a more horrific way to spend your last moments on the planet Earth um, than what I just described until you hear what happened to his girlfriend. She was taken back um, to the assailant's home. She was forced into a back room of the house where she was hogtied with strips of fabric from a bedding set. For several hours, she endured brutal sexual assaults. She was repeatedly raped in every possible way imaginable. She was then kicked and beaten with several objects, including a broken chair leg. She suffered major wounds to her genital area. She also had major blows to the head. Bleeding, she was finally dragged out of the back room and into the living room. Realizing that they had left DNA on the victim, the attackers tried to cover their tracks. They poured bleach all over her. 
realizing that they, leave, they left DNA in the victim, they poured bleach down her throat. She was still alive when they wrapped her body in a black garbage bag. They wrapped her head in a white plastic grocery bag. Then she was placed in a garbage can in the kitchen of the house. She was still alive. Her last minutes on earth were spent slowly suffocating in a garbage can after she had been savagely beaten and raped for hours. Here's one of the dirt bags explaining it. He, by the way, was trying to act like he had nothing to do with it at all. Sunday night, he, um, he brings the girl out of, out of his room. And I noticed that she didn't have any clothes on from the waist down. No shoes on, no socks. As he has her in the kitchen, me and Vanessa and George, he make all of us come in the kitchen in the back um, utility room, make us stand there for a minute. So as we're all standing there, he um, puts his hand around, he puts his arm around the girl neck, tries to kill her, tries to choke her. He lets her go when she falls. She falls to the floor. We're, we're, we're all thinking that he's, he, didn't, he didn't kill that girl. He ties the girl up, put her in the, in, in the garbage can. I just want to remind you that this was someone's daughter. This is not your standard case. It's so far beyond rape. It was so violent. The only explanation for it is hate and evil. But was it labeled a hate crime? No. No. Did it receive media attention at the time? I apologize to you. I don't know if I even covered this story. I don't know how it didn't get on the radar. Other than the story just doesn't fit the agenda of the media's favorite special interest groups. There were no Al Sharptons, no Jesse Jacksons. There's still no Al Sharpton, no Jesse Jackson. There's no one calling for social justice. The suspects, they're all convicted the original judge was discovered to have a drug addiction. It got him disbarred. So wait a minute, what happened to their conviction? Well, that opened up the doors for the killers to try to abuse the justice system. And all but one have repeatedly pursued retrials and appeals. The lone female attacker had her sentence reduced by a third. This is a miscarriage of justice forcing the family to live this horror over and over and over again every time they're dragged back into the court battle. And to give you an idea of what they're going through, here's Shannon's dad during the trial. She was proud of the, her faith in God. And one of the things that hurts the most is she was proud that she saved herself for a husband someday. I will never get to walk her down the aisle. I will never dance with her at her wedding. We live in a time now in America where special interest groups dictate what matters and what doesn't. Forgets the merits of what actually happened. 
crimes are now judged based solely on who committed them and what they looked like and who the victim was. And if you don't fall into a group that has an Al Sharpton character hounding the media, well then you're all out of luck. Why wasn't the story given real coverage? Because the victims were young, white, a couple in a nice car, and the killers were four black men and one black woman. Is it because there's no special interest group that covers this category of crime? Real social justice will happen when justice is blind and when we all remember that only God can oversee true and everlasting justice. And we all remember vengeance belongs solely to him.